Okay, good afternoon everyone. So yes, I'll be talking about the growing potential for K-band geodesy and probably many of you may be wondering now what is this K-band? How does it fit into geodesy and what's the connection um, to uh, GIGO? So maybe we'll start somewhere uh, more familiar. So going to the GIGO's webpage, if we look at the list of observations, you go to the observations tab, there's this list of um, instruments and techniques and I'll specifically talk about very long baseline interferometry. So for those not that familiar with, um, with the VLBI technique, so we have these big radio telescopes. They distribute it around the globe, separated by thousands of kilometers with the distance between any two of these telescopes or pairs of telescopes uh, we call a baseline. And we observe these extragalactic radio sources, the quasars, and um, we get a, wave, uh, a radio wave from a quasar at some position, in this case from here, and the radio waves will first hit antenna 2 and sometimes later antenna 1. So the wave front from arriving at antenna 1 has this extra path length to travel relative to antenna 2, and the time taken to traverse this extra path is called the geometric delay tau. So the primary observable for geodetic and astrometric VLBI is this geometric delay Tau. So by measuring and modeling tau for each baseline of the network, we can then precisely infer the positions of our radio sources, our quasars, but also the positions of our network stations or the distances between them, these baselines. Oops, one back. So one of the advantages that VLBI has over the other space uh, geodetic techniques is that these quasars have no detected proper motion. The sources don't move. In other words, for VLBI, uh, we can say we have only two orbit parameters per source that are needed over decades versus satellite orbit parameters, uh, which must be updated uh, every few hours. So back to the GIGO's webpage, and if we now look at the product list, and specifically the products or the main products that we get from VLBI, there's the Earth orientation parameters, station positions, it contributes to the terrestrial reference frame, and then there's also the celestial reference frame. And VLBI is the only technique for the construction and maintenance of the celestial reference frame. So what does the GIGO's webpage have to say about the celestial reference frame? It says the ICRF comprises a catalog of precise equatorial coordinates of our quasars observed by very long baseline interferometry. And that historically, the ICRF has been observed in SX bands at 2.3 and 8.4 gigahertz. It also talks about realizations at other radio wavelengths, K-band, 24 gigahertz, that I'll be talking about today, and also at KA-band. And then it says that currently these are considered as less precise. So today I'll talk about VLBI, specifically the International Celestial Reference Frame, specifically the band, uh, uh, the K-band Celestial Reference Frame, and I'll tell you that this is no longer the case. It's no longer less precise precise, but I'll also talk about the growing potential of this K-band frame for geodesy. But before um, I go ahead, these are all the institutions, my co-authors, K-band members that has been working on the K-band celestial reference frame for the last uh, 10 years and have made uh, quite a huge contribution um, to the success of this project. Okay, <clears throat> sorry, so let's move on. What is the motivation for going to higher radio frequencies? Why do we want to do it? So first of all, the lower frequency bands, SX, are being hurt by RFI issues. So this is degrading the ability to collect clean SX data. Going to higher radio frequencies allows us to observe closer to the sun, closer to the galactic plane. It also provides calibrators for VLBI, for astronomy, face referencing observations at higher radio frequencies. And then nowadays, many stations typically have K-band receivers. We are seeing a decline in stations with SX dual band capability. Also, next generation receivers and instruments will support high frequency work. And then the most important reasons why we decided to go to higher radio frequencies, well, it's basically just the factor of free improvement in resolution going from the lower frequency bands to the higher frequency bands. And then the most important thing is in general, uh, 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 generally that we saw sources are more compact 
the morphology of the sources more compact as you go to the higher radio frequencies. And I'll just uh, well go back to uh, the slide where I talked about VLBI and this uh, two-orbit parameter advantage I talk about uh, to also talk a bit more about the source structure. So we observe uh, these sources, our quasars, and if you want to get precise positions for some object, ideally you want to observe a point source. In the case of the quasars that we observe, we want these sources to be as compact as possible. We don't want sources with bright extended emission or um, bright secondary components. But, sorry, I have to turn around. This is unfortunately not always the case. Many of these sources do have bright extended emission and they also change over time. So it's been shown that source structure and its variability can introduce significant errors in astrometric VLBI, delay measurements, also instabilities in, the, in individual source positions, and this makes it necessary to model structure parameters. So basically we can think of this as degra uh, degrading this two orbit parameter advantage that I talked about before. But I also mentioned that we go to higher radio frequencies because in general we see that the sources are more compact. So that's our solution to the source structure problem. We go to higher radio frequencies and the reason for that is that the parent source structure in AGN is a function of frequency. We call it as frequency dependent opacity. Thus source morphology generally becomes more compact, sources become more co uh, core dominated at the higher radio frequencies. But I'm not just saying that, we actually tested this. Uh, so we had these three near simultaneous um, observing uh, uh, epochs of observing sessions on the very long baseline array where we observed that S, X, K and Q band, uh, 453 ICRF sources uh, that we tested here. I'm just showing one example um, source. So um, in the top panel here, um, the images are on, all on absolute scale. The resolution is shown here by this um, gray beam. And I mean, what you can clearly see from this is the improvement in the resolution by almost a factor of 20 going from S band um, to Q band. Okay, and then in the um, lower panel here, uh, we just scale the images to, um, to the beam size, just to get a clearer view of what the source structure looks like. And what you should also see is that the source becomes more compact, um, less extended structure as you go to the higher radio um, frequencies. That was just one example. Of course, in general, we see this for most of the sources that we look at things improve if we go to higher radio frequencies. So in terms of our K-band celestial reference frame, um, what I said before on the GIGOS webpage, it says less precise. It's talking about the icr free, the current standard that was adopted by the IAU in 2018. That's five years ago. Since then, we've made a lot of improvements. This is what our current K-band celestial reference frame looks like. This is the distribution, sky distribution of our sources. And um, each individual source is color coded by its uh, position uncertainty, top for right ascension, bottom for our declinations. And we now have 1,187 sources in our catalog versus the 800 and something we had for icr free. 2.3 million observations versus the 0.5 million observations from icr free. And, well, this is the really exciting part. If you look at our median precision and right ascension and declination, we are now comparable to the S6 band frame. So we are very excited about this. That's why I'm standing here today sharing this wonderful news with you. Uh, five years later, yes, and, um, and we're there. So some of the strengths of the K-band frame, we have uniform spatial density. We're the best band from near the galactic plane. I talked about source structure, less source structure. Our formal sigmas are now almost exactly the same as Essex, particular right ascensions. And we only have 2.3 million observations versus Essex bands, 18.1 million observations. Some of our weaknesses, our uh, honosphere calibrations is done by GPS. We don't have dual band like Essex, we only have K band. The self is still a bit weak. Um, this is due to limited single baseline, only two stations in the south between South Africa and Australia. And you will also see there that our uh, 
um, precision is a bit worse in declination than right ascension, and this is because of a lack of long north-south baselines, more than 3,000 uh, kilometers. So this is our K-band network. Um, we started with VLBA observations in 2015, and you can see I just talked about our declinations um, being a bit worse than, than right ascension. We don't have those long north-south baselines, and in the south, only the single a baseline between South Africa and Australia, but then more recently in 2022, we added more stations. Uh, the Yebes 40 meters started observing nice long north south baseline, really cool. And then um, also we added the KVN antennas, Korean VLBI network, and the Suyong antenna in um, Korea, and also MOPRA in um, Australia. So now we have these really nice long north-south baselines as well as more help in the south. And we can already see that this is making, making a difference. Comparing our network with um, some of the other networks um, for geodesy and astrometry. So this is from a report in 2022 by Haas and Beeren. And here they report about 40 radio telescopes for the legacy network observations at Essex band. Um, that was the current status. We all know that Vigos will become the workhorse for, for the IVS, so it will take over from the Essex legacy network. Vigos currently does not have a celestial reference frame. That is something that, that they will build up. Um, and then in 2022, if we look at the Vigos network, there were around nine antennas with the plan to increase it to around 30 stations in the next uh, five to, to 10 years. How does K-band compare? So you saw this map. We have around 18 stations dedicated to K-band work at the moment. Um, but then if you look at this map, and I'll show a larger ver uh, uh, um, version of this map just now, this is the stations currently in the world with K-band receivers. Okay, and free that's planning to get K-band receivers in the near future. So right now in the world, there's around 40 stations in the world with K-band receivers, which puts our K-band work in a very good position because that's the same amount of stations um, as Essex um, had in 2022 and much more than is planned for Vigos even in the next 10 years. Okay, there's the slightly bigger version, but what I want to talk about next is that higher radio frequencies are also gaining prominence due to its comp compatibility with next generation radio telescopes. Um, things like uh, the Koreans have the simultaneous multi-frequency KQW band receivers. This is being installed on many radio telescopes, including the European VLBI network telescopes, and um, our plan is that in future we can have a celestial reference frame at K, Q, and perhaps even W band, and do this simultaneously at the same time. Um, JPL has uh, um, been testing their uh, broadband receiver, 8 to 36 gigahertz receiver on the VLBA. Um, so that will provide us with dual band capability in the future. Um, solving our, our ionosphere problems. And then also if we look at the design of the NGVLA, that would definitely support high frequency work. It does not support dual band capability, for example, um, for SX work. Um, in terms of the geodesy part, looking at EOPs and baselines, this is very preliminary work. Our main aim was the celestial reference frame, but recently we said, okay, how well do we do if we look at geodesy products as well? So this is work done by Hanna Krasner, um, and here she compared our K-band, uh, or EOPs from our K-band VLBA data with uh, the official IRS time series. I show some examples here. This is from two different analysis packages um, that we use for our K-band, and well, as you can see here, the IR is uh, polar motion formal areas. Uh, um, uh, for polar motion, the um, formal areas is dominated by the genus S technique. But if we look here at mutation and UT1 minus UTC, the K band formal areas are below the IRS values um, in recent years. So we think there's really some potential for, for our K band, is, um, also for geodesy. Here we uh, compare our K band EOP mean formal areas with um, SX observations. Um, 
I show a few examples here. Uh, this is from the R1 and R4 SXNet uh, work. This is specifically dedicated to EOP work. And um, in yellow shows the SX work uh, using the very long baseline array, the VLBA, and then in blue, our K-band from our VLBA observations. Those are shown in blue. And again, we see a lot of potential for K-band um, for the future. Like I said, preliminary results. Here she also looked at baseline length repeatability for K-band. K-band on, on top compared to SX band, both from VLBA observations. Two plots look very similar. And again, we're very excited um, because we really see a lot of potential um, for K-band. This is our roadmap. Don't stress, I am not going to go through all of this. This is just to show you that we have an extensive roadmap. We're continuously working on improving things, making our celestial reference frame better. Um, and also, uh, what I specifically want to talk about is our products. But let's first say we have a, a website. If you're interested to look at all these things in more detail, our roadmap, you're welcome to go to our website. We recently had our first um, workshop, K-Band workshop. It was actually this Monday and Tuesday at Yebes Observatory. So thanks a lot to Yebes Observatory. And then they had to, to also organize um, these GIGOS days. So in terms of products, one of our um, items on our roadmap is make K-Band VLBI products available to the community, astrometric, geodetic, astronomical community. And specifically in terms of GIGOS, K-Band and GIGOS, what's the message that I have for, for, for GIGOS, for all of you sitting here? There's another source of high accuracy VLBI results available for geodesy. Now you know. The VLBI techniques, technique <laughs> brings stability to GIGOS because of the only, of only two orbit parameters per source, which is needed over the, uh, 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 that's needed over decades. VLBI uniquely measures mutation, UT1 minus UTC, thus having multiple sources of VLBI is important for a robust GIGOS system. K-band provides this independent set of mutation and UT1 minus UTC measurements, making GIGOS more robust. That is the end of my presentation. This is my summary. It's not a conventional summary. It's in the form of a K-band poem by Chat GBT4. So you're welcome to read our poem and hopefully remember K-band. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the very nice, interesting presentation. Are there questions or comments? I'm happy to know that uh, this chat, chat GPT-4 knows GIGOS. This is good. This is good. Uh, no questions? Okay, so we can move. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for the talk. Are there any plans to release the data also to other analysis centers that they could immediately start working with that data? Or is that a problem? Yes, up to now we didn't. But um, the whole idea of yeah, giving this presentation um, is because it's on our roadmap. That's the idea. The next step going forward, making the data available to the community. So the answer is yes. <laughs> Can I, I have it already. <laughs> so um, just as a brief comment, very interesting ideas. And of course, it would be worth to, let's say, to consider uh, such a transition. But as you know, there are also a lot of weaknesses of K-band observations. You Usually, the signals are much weaker than in X-band or uh, lower frequencies. Also, you need very large antennas for that, which are, for the geodetic applications, not so convenient. Not because they are much slower. That's why we changed to the Vigos concept, where we have very small antennas moving very fast to gain a lot of observables during a short time period. And so, but I think um, what the next step would be to uh, even uh, improve the um, uh, transformation between SX band, CRF, and the K band. And another weakness is ionosphere. 
just using some GPS results, I think, is not enough on the long term. And you, you really need uh, dual frequency observations to correct the ionosphere. So, but to do, to, to um, calculate transformation parameters between and compare the um, uh, frequencies, the positions of the two frequencies, X band and K band, would be worth to work more on that. Thank you um, for pointing out all our weaknesses. <laughs> yes, of course. I mean, um, no band is perfect in terms of um, the sources being weaker, the actual sources themselves. Um, it's only when we actually go up to Q band where we see that there's fewer sources that we can observe. If you look at the um, mean flux density, um, we did these uh, near simultaneous observations, it's almost the same at K band than you find at X band. Um, also, yes, the ionosphere, we don't have dual band, but I mean, the future looks bright. There is tri band, wide band receivers. Most stations across the globe is now investing in high frequency work and looking at wide band or tri band type systems. So I definitely think that going into the future, that problem will also be solved.